from the studios of Farm Journal Broadcast. This is Ag Day. Emus with attitudes. Emmanuel, do not do it. Emmanuel, don't do it. How they're taking the world by storm. A possible break from high fertilizer prices. First, uh, no more tariffs on uh, that were potentially going to go on imported nitrogen fertilizer, primarily UAN, um, which is good. As farmers in Ukraine harvest a deadly crop. That's another shell strike. Producers in Europe and the U.S. battle high heat. High temperatures combined with lack of water. With several hot days to go. The latest right now on Ag Day. Good morning, I'm Clinton Griffiths. Happening right now, dangerous heat continuing to impact large portions of the country with more than 100 million people under excessive heat warnings or advisories. And a lack of rain in areas of farm country is just adding to the concern. Without enough moisture, crops can wither in that high heat. And this heat is hitting at a key time. USDA reporting 37% of the crop now in the silking stage for corn. In Arkansas, 95% of the crop is in the silking phase with 62% of that crop rated good to excellent right now. But topsoil moisture supplies were 65% very short and temperatures yesterday were up in the triple digits in some parts of the state. In some instances in past years, we've had some pollination issues. And so that we always see or typically see pollination issues where we get high, high temperatures combined with lack of water and you know we've got that right now so if you drive around the countryside you see every well running and so you know from a management standpoint trying to keep everything irrigated up is really the key. The heat is even more intense across Europe where some areas have hit all-time records. In Italy experts say the hot and dry conditions could wipe out a third of this season's harvest of rice and corn. The European Commission recently downgraded its soft wheat harvest estimates from 130 million tons to 125 million. Also very telling, the latest root zone moisture map just released. Here we track it from early June to now. We're seeing fewer blue areas, especially in the Midwest, with more dry conditions popping up in Iowa, Nebraska, and points further west and south. And this heat wave may just be the beginning. Meteorologist Bang Yersavik continues our team coverage with a look ahead, Matt. Yeah, Clinton, and that heat and humidity, it's not going anywhere. And if we take a look at the jet stream heading into the end of this week, notice where this ridge is really right across the entire lower 48, even that heat getting all the way up into the northern plains. A little bit of a break for the uh, northern part of the east coast there, parts of the mid-Atlantic and the northeast, dealing with a little bit of a break from the heat and humidity, but still we're going to be dealing with this not only this week, but into next week as well. Here's a look at those temperatures heading into today, 80s and 90s all the way up into the upper Midwest, 90 in Chicago, 102 in Cincinnati and upper 90s, lower triple digits there right along the East Coast with a heat really ramping up across parts of Texas and areas where that humidity is high could be seeing that temperature closing in on 115 to 120. That's what it could feel like in parts of Texas and Oklahoma. But even into next week, not just this week, Next week, this area highlighted in orange all the way from the Ohio Valley back to the West Coast. Slight chance for excessive heat and excessive heat is defined as 10 to 15 degrees above normal. 30% chance of that there, but it's really parts of the northern Rockies there and right here across the center of the country where we're really watching for an area that could be looking at 10 to 15 degrees above normal heading through much of next week. Clinton, back to you. All right, thanks, Matt. And we want to hear from you about the heat. What are you doing to protect your crops or your livestock? As we continue to keep watch on this story, share your pictures and video of what you're doing with us. Just head over to the Ag Day Facebook page and look for this post. Farmers face record high fertilizer prices this spring and have been even more concerned about a repeat next year. However, there is some good news on the trade front. Ag Day's Michelle Rook has an update. Clinton, the U.S. International Trade Commission has ruled against imposing steep tariffs on urea ammonium nitrate fertilizers imported from Russia and Trinidad and Tobago. They voted that U.S. domestic producers are not injured by imports of UAN products. The findings will end import duties of up to 123% on Russia and 112% on Trinidad and Tobago. These two markets account for nearly 80% of typical U.S. imports. 
Now, the National Corn Growers Association came out strongly against the tariffs, and President Chris Edgington tells us this was a big win for farmers across the country. First, uh, no more tariffs on, uh, that were potentially going to go on imported nitrogen fertilizer, primarily UAN, um, which is good. Prices are already high. Uh, supply is short. People are worried about what's going to happen this fall. Edgington says the ruling was rare because it went against a recommendation for tariffs from the Commerce Department. That gives him hope about an ITC ruling regarding tariffs on phosphate fertilizer from Morocco that is still pending. That in itself is, is trend setting, positive. Um, and then we got another one out there, you know, uh, we got uh, phosphorus is still out in the courts. Um, and so this makes me pretty optimistic that we got an opportunity to, to get a difference in that one as well. Um, and that would really be positive. See if industries filed a petition with the ITC in late 2021 requesting that the commission place tariffs on UAN. Officials have expressed disappointment and say the action will perpetuate an unlevel playing field for the domestic industry. The ITC's decision takes effect immediately. Fertilizer expert Josh Linville with Stonex Financial tells me this means that normal import flow should return. He says that will cause the price per actual pound of nitrogen differential between urea and UAN to narrow once again, and that should lower UAN prices. All right, thanks, Michelle. A deal is expected to be signed as soon as this week to resume grain exports from the Ukraine's Black Sea region. But the UN Secretary General has warned there is still work that needs to be done to reach a final agreement. And it's reported the Russian forces are still attacking Ukrainian ports, with the port city of Odessa being struck by seven missiles this week. Ukraine is one of the world's largest exporters of wheat, corn and sunflower oil, but grain supplies to many countries have been cut off since Russia's invasion of Ukraine began. Now, last month, it estimated Ukraine was only able to move about 1.4 million metric tons of grain, down 43% from the previous year. It's some issue of life and death for many human beings. And the question is that Russia has to de-block and allow the Ukrainian grain to be exported. Otherwise, we will have to continue claiming that they are using food as a weapon without any kind of consideration for human beings' life. It has to be said, loudly. USAID this week announced food aid for countries in the Horn of Africa, which relies heavily on grain from Ukraine. The agency said it was providing nearly $1.3 billion in aid to support that region where unprecedented drought also means more than 18 million people need humanitarian assistance. Russia's war goes far beyond missile strikes and artillery attacks as Moscow's grain blockage adds to that global food shortage with Ukrainian farms now on the front line. And there are no expectations things will improve anytime soon. Ivan Watson reports. A war against one of the biggest breadbaskets in the world. Ukraine's fertile farmland now a battleground. Military drone footage exclusively obtained by CNN shows Russian artillery pounding wheat fields, burning the summer harvest charcoal black. Farmers race to protect their crops. Until Russia's invasion, Ukraine was the world's fifth largest exporter of wheat. All right, this looks like some kind of munition over here. Now Ukrainian farmers are harvesting a deadly crop. Mikhail says these are pieces of uh, Russian rockets that they gathered out of the fields. Mikhail Lubchenka takes me on a tour of his farm. He'll show us. That's another shell strike. Acres of wheat waiting to be harvested within earshot of pounding Russian artillery. This is absolutely surreal. We're amid the wreckage of previous battles, armored personnel carriers, military vehicles, and then you've got farmers out here that are harvesting wheat right now. The vehicles that have been destroyed here, this could have happened back in March, February, much earlier, but we're also seeing these impact craters from shell strikes that we're told probably took place within the last couple of weeks. Despite the threats, these brave farmers still bring in their harvest, only to face another obstacle. 
This is 3,000 tons of wheat from last year's harvest. А це нині з-за того, що окупанти заблокували порти, і ми не можемо порти зробити, щоб вони працювали. He can't sell this wheat because the Russian military has blockaded Ukraine's ports, so there's no way for this to be sold except at an, an enormous loss. Ukrainian ports, where ships once carried millions of tons of grain a month to global markets, now blockaded by the Russian Navy. But Ukrainian farmers continue to face deadly threats on land, making it too risky for many to plant crops for next year. This frontline farmer vows not to give up. Our soldiers are fighting and dying to get rid of these occupiers, he says. We need to feed our country, the soldiers, and help the whole world with our food. That's why we'll keep working. He calls his farm the second front in this deadly war. Ivan Watson, CNN, in southern Ukraine. All right, thanks, Ivan. Now, markets are waiting to see if Ukraine's Black Sea ports will reopen soon. As both corn and soybeans trade lower on Tuesday, we'll have a look at what markets are following coming up next. And later, a couple of emus that are just living their best lives and going viral while doing it in the country. Ag Day is brought to you by The End Zone by Farm Shop MFG, which allows you to rehydrate your soybeans from 10 to 13 percent. On a 20,000 bushel bin, that's an extra semi-load added to your bottom line. Order your End Zone fan control by July 31st and receive $200 off. Corn futures fell for the first session in the past five. Michelle Rook is back with a deeper dive into what's pulling these markets in opposite directions. Joining us with market analysis today is Randy Martins and Martins and Ag. Grains all lower on Tuesday, Randy, and it looked like a flop in the weather models had funds heading for the door. It did. I mean, yeah, then, it, you know, really we were expecting to see, a, you know, a little bit more strength continue. The, you know, the crop progress report didn't bring us anything that was terribly bullish or bearish for that matter. But, you know, the change in the weather forecast, and it seems like that's what everybody is watching right now is the weather. Put a little bit, pulled a little bit of the heat out, put a little bit of rain in on that 6 to 10, and it created a little bit of a run for the door. Right. And most of that change is coming in the Western Corn Belt, though, isn't it? It is. It's mainly, you know, and, and that's where mainly where the heat was expected to sit up the most as well. So it is coming here. We're looking at, you know, parts of Illinois, um, the North Dakota or the Minnesota, Iowa border picking up. Uh, they're saying upwards to four inches of rain in this time frame. That certainly would make a difference uh, if it was realized. So do you think the crop is getting bigger or not? You know, I, I don't. I mean, you look at the crop driving around and, and just doing some crop scouting. You know, we've got a decent crop out there, but it has it's not a stellar crop. You know, we're behind, so we're going to need a lot more time as well. But, it, you know, corn looks the best of the crops. Uh, beans look a little tough, and it looks like it, it's going to be tough for them to be able to get to be trend line, let alone uh, a record yield. And I don't think we got a record corn yield. Wheat market setting back here again, talk of this uh, corridor allowing Ukrainian exports through and that the deal may be close, but we had taken all the wheat or weather premium out of that wheat market prior to that. So do you buy that? I don't. I mean, you know, I, I know that it could allow for some grain to start coming out, but, you know, we already are hearing, you know, adversity there because Russia is already shipping some out of Crimea, you know, which is, you know, some of the stolen grain that had been picked out earlier. They're burning fields, uh, wheat fields before they're getting harvested. So I think there's a lot more concerns out there than what they're going to ship. And, and I think this is more of a political play for Russia than it is a, uh, than it's actually going to try to help Ukraine. Yeah, I would agree. Thanks so much for joining us. Randy Martinson, Martinson Ag, and we'll have full analysis at agweb.com or Ag Day coming up. Ag Day, sponsored by Total Acre. Randy Dowdy and David Hula's Next Level program is now Total Acre. We're still focused on farmers helping farmers while hitting record yields and ROI. Check us out at TotalAcre.com. Meteorologist Matt Urasavik joining us here, taking a look at our national forecast. And we're starting with 
really the heat, and it begins back here in the southwest. Oh yeah, in the parts of the southwest, San Joaquin Valley, very important growing region, and we've uh, been talking about triple digit heat there for a while. That's going to continue, but it also spreading to the rest of the country as well. And you can see temperatures in the early morning in parts of Arizona and Southern California in the 90s, very hot and dry back in the west. Some rain moving through uh, parts of the four corners, but still Arizona, Southern California, Nevada, and then right up through the San Joaquin. Watch this as we head through the afternoon. Look at all of that pink and even some white come onto the map here. Temperatures well above 100 degrees, not only in Southern California and in Arizona, where we expect that this time of year, but even warmer than average. And then Parts of the San Joaquin Valley, Fresno, down to Bakersfield, over 100 degrees there as well. 90s and triple digits all over this map and much of this map as well. Here's a look at the afternoon. Much of Texas and Oklahoma seeing temperatures well above that century mark. And we're going to continue to see that not only today, but uh, as we head through the next couple of days and even into next week, as we talked about a little bit ago. Temperatures during the morning, you can see the heat and the humidity really from Texas on to the east, right through the Gulf Coast. Very, very humid, so 100 degrees feeling even warmer than that there in Atlanta and Dallas as we head through tomorrow afternoon. But then 80s and 90s spreading all the way up into the upper Midwest, parts of the Great Lakes, and even eastward towards the East Coast as well. And here's a look at that feels like temperature. We talked about Atlanta. They'll see a little bit of cloud cover here from time to time with some rain. Just to the west of there, though, where the sunshine breaks out, Feels like temperatures that heat index upwards of 110 to 115 degrees from Texas all the way in to parts of Alabama. So very hot and this ridge that's been building. It's keeping this heat, this humidity here. It's not going anywhere. It sticks with us as we head through the end of this week and into next week. There also is a chance for a couple of stronger storms. Ohio Valley mainly really from Indianapolis on to Pittsburgh, and uh, that's with this kind of cold front moving eastward as we head through the day. Otherwise, we've got some showers and storms in the southeast, but not much else going on with lots of sunshine and all of that heat and humidity. We'll keep tracking that right here on Ag Day. That's a look around the country. Now let's take a look at the weather where you live. Gaylord, Michigan, breezy with showers likely a high near 79 degrees. McAllister, Oklahoma, hot and humid with an isolated storm. 108 is the high and Red Bluff, California, sunny and hot, a high near 104. Despite less demand from China, U.S. pork exports climbed to new 2022 highs in May. The U.S. Meat Export Federation says May shipments were 224,000 metric tons. While it's down more than 20% year over year, it's the highest monthly volume since last November. Now, so far this year, total exports are also off about 20%. However, Mexico and the Dominican Republic are on a record pace. Speaking of China, the country's second quarter pork output climbed. The National Bureau of Statistics saying its output climbed to 13.78 million tons, which is the highest level for the period since 2015. That surge coming after farmers there increased sow numbers for the last two years after that deadly wave of African swine fever. Coming up, oh, those crazy farm animals. You can now add two emus to the lineup, including one who has given birth to its own catchphrase. Next in the country. Registration is open for the 2022 Pro Farmer Crop Tour. Join our team as we gain insight on the 2022 growing season in person or online. Visit profarmercroptour.com forward slash register to select the stop nearest you. Aren't animals something? An iPhone hating emu is cracking up the internet and coining a catchphrase. Emmanuel, do not do it. Emmanuel, don't do it. Whenever Taylor Blake tries to make a video at Knuckle Bump Farms in Florida where they raise miniature cattle, she's always getting bumped by, well, you know who, Emmanuel the Emu. And now he's gone viral, along with the phrase, Emmanuel, don't do it. Taylor says Emmanuel hates two things, phones and buttons, but she says she hasn't lost a phone yet over it and says that Emmanuel is 
actually crazy about her. It could be worse. A woman named Amanda at a place called Useless Farm in Ontario is getting pecked repeatedly, suffering minor injuries inflicted by her emu named Karen. Now, Amanda says she doesn't know why Karen hates her so much. All those emus, always so curious. And that's all the time we have this morning. I'm sure glad you tuned in. From all of us here at Ag Day, I'm Clinton Griffiths. Have a great day out in Bunker.